right, well, I'm here in Maiden, North Carolina, and today we are looking at Jay Stanford's 100% scratch built Super Cub that you can build too. I'm Jay Stanford. Uh, we're from St. Mary's, Georgia. This is my family's blue Super Cub. My father and I scratch built this airplane. Uh, started in 2009 and took five years of Saturdays. Uh, lots of work and lots of effort on both of our parts and it was a, a genuine learning experience for us. How did you come about finding out that it's available? I had no idea you could scratch build a classic Cub or a Super Cub. So I was a member of uh, a forum called supercub.org for a long time researching things for our tailor craft that our family has and how to change things on the engine and things people were doing for bigger tires and I started finding these build threads um, there were some a few people that were building airplanes on there uh, Christian Sturm was building a scratch built super cub and I watched Christian build this airplane and it really made me want one I had a chance to fly a Super Cub and it pretty much sealed the deal. Um, we got together um, and found the plans. They're available on, on uh, supercubproject.com. All the drawings are open to, to anybody. You can get on there and search any bracket, fuselage, cowling, cowling stiffener, it's all on there. So we started downloading plans, gathered some, some resources and built a jig on the hangar floor in the back and started building a fuselage. And it started off pretty slow. You know, there's a lot of learning curve on that. And there's a lot of snapshot on what you want to do. You know, the cub that you see here behind me is really a snapshot of about mid-2009 fuselage technology and, a, and modifications that people were putting on them then. It's got the standard Super Cub stuff of inverted dog legs and extended baggages and my airplane has a left-hand door, something that, that was popular at the time. It's not something that I would do if I was going to build another one, unless you're building a seaplane. Um, we just started sticking tubes together. I mean, it was a little bit more complicated than that with the jig and locating wing, wing attach points and gear attach points, tail post, engine mount, setting the angles up correctly and doing the research on what angle you wanted to put the engine at to optimize it. Piper has it up and to the right ours is zero zero and it's one inch lower and one inch farther back so placing the engine is important for what we were learning about putting a 360 on a cub so Jay going back to the plans for a minute um, <clears throat> not only are these available but they're free they are free. so is this just a, a great big uh, PDF packet or do you have to search each individual one and like, how is it kind of cataloged it, it's not one big PDF packet. That would be that'd be really difficult to go through. It, what's what's neat about it is the PDF is named the part number, and then it has a brief text description at the end of it. So when you start and you go on that site and you want to look at the fuselage, you find the fuselage main print, and then on that are callouts for all the weldments. And then you can go, you can not Google, but you can search in that in that P, in that search window that part number and you'll find that weldment so if you need to build a forward gear attach fitting you can pull that part number I have no idea what it is but you pull that part number up and it tells you the specs of the material and it's a hand-drawn scan of the original super cub plans everything is in there from seat attach just it, it's all and it either takes some digging and there are some revisions that we found. Um, there's definitely a couple changes that are drawn into this into this wing spar locations that once you get rolling with it, you can pretty much figure these things out. And supercub.org is a huge resource to bounce these things back and forth against. One of the things I like to ask people in building um, two questions is, what was the most challenging part of the entire build? And then also what was the most enjoyable part of the build? Wow, um, that's a that's an on-the-spot question. <laughs> I think the wings were the most challenging part for us. It, 
putting together a set of wings when you buy spar blanks and make and repair and fix and locate and drill all the holes and figuring out the spacing of the ribs that you want to use, the spacing of the flaps, the spacing of the aileron hangers, where you're going to put, I mean the wings are are by far the most complicated part. The fuselage is, it was enjoyable. I mean it was lots of work, lots of burns, lots of getting shocked with the TIG machine. <laughs> um, but the the wings are and you have to build two of them that are exactly the same and identical and it was it was a a long time building the wings it took us the entire project took five years of saturdays we'd work a thursday every once in a while take a, fr a saturday off to go fishing or whatnot but the wings the wings took two years to build now, is there a built-in washout to them, so you had to kind of raise up one corner of it and have a twist built into it, or no? Uh, yeah, there is, and, a, and in the Piper plans, it talks about how you set the wash up out, and it's a man. Don't 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 use this to build yours, but if my memory is right, it's a three-eighths inch wood block, two bays out from the tip, on the rear spar, is the standard Piper washout. Hey guys, one second. Hey guys, you've probably seen me traveling a whole lot these days. What makes all this possible, getting this original aviation content, is sponsors like these. Dynon Avionics at DynonAvionics.com AirTech Coatings at AirTechCoatings.com Airworks at AirWorksAviation.com Avination at AvianationUSA.com Check the description below for links to these great companies and visit our website at experimentalaircraftchannel.com for events, our video library arranged in easy to find playlists on specific topics, affiliate products, aviation merchandise, and so much more. If you like these videos that we are producing weekly, give that like button a click and engage all notifications so you don't miss a single episode. So being this is a completely all fabric aircraft and rightfully so being a cub, uh, what was the experience like for you um, covering this with with the fabric and and the whole process? So it was the the fabric was was pretty straightforward for us. We've covered many airplanes before this. My father has rebuilt and recovered airplanes my entire life. I've done wings and helped with fuselages. The wings are pretty simple to cover. You know, more so than the fuselage with the seams where you put the tapes how how that stuff goes together we used polyfiber on this it's what it's the old go-to it's what we what we had laying laying around in cans in the paint locker a lot of this airplane was scrounged out of our out of our um, shop a lot of the pieces and components are things that we found up in the in the attic that just kind of fit but the the fabric part of it was really fun my dad and i we spent about about eight months of our time covering and painting the airplane, and it was just a pleasure to do that with my dad. It, I, I really learned a lot. He's he's a he's a hell of a craftsman and an and artist when it comes to this stuff, and and it was nice to get that 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 learning and the the training from him. All right, so now getting into the heart of this thing, uh, what are the options? What are the engine options as far as horsepower available? For this airframe and then what did you decide to go with so the pa-18s can you can put a c90 on them all the way up to I mean, people have put 540s on them um, there's a lot of a lot of balance that happens with a 150 horsepower an 0320 cub um, we went with an 0360 we happened to have a pretty good deal on one so we decided to put a 0360 on it um, the 0360 presents a little bit more of a challenge. There's a there's a weight penalty on the nose, which is, you know, not something you necessarily want. But we, we did to, mit to mitigate that is to suck the engine back an inch, and that helps with the CG a little bit. The engine um, engine came off of I think it came off of a Cherokee 180. Um, I took the engine apart and we sent crankshafts and rods and did the the overhaul 
of the engine. I built the engine in, in our in our family's hangar. It's a nine and a half to one compression engine. It has an aero performance cam. It's got a four into one exhaust system that we we built. We, it's uh, equal length tubes and started off with the PVC pipe and heating it up with a heat gun to figure out how we were going to fit all that in there. Each, each runner is 32 inches long on every cylinder. has dual P mags, a uh, little bit of tuning to the carburetor, had to up jet it a little bit for the higher horsepower. Um, there's some valve work, some valve seat work, and a little bit of homebrew Georgia cylinder porting. But it's, uh, it's turned into quite the runner. Um, it it hasn't missed a beat in 650 hours now. I've changed things along the way. It's got a Sky Dynamics flywheel on it. Uh, deleted the alternator. Um, once I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but that's that's how we've morphed this airplane from what our original mission was into what it is today. All right. So talk to us about the interior a little bit. You've got pretty absolute below basic panel in your your plane actually. <laughs> So one of the things we wanted to do when we were building the fuselage, we saw all this space that was up in front of where the panel was. And we pretty much decided that we didn't want to put an instrument panel in the airplane. Because then you, you have this metal going across here and you lose all, you lose this space out here for visibility. And, and it makes a nice table to throw a water bottle on. So we went with bare minimum VFR instrumentation. I have everything you need, nothing you don't, except for a couple engine instruments just to monitor health. So I've got a, a CHT and an EGT is, is the only extra in a fuel flow. Um, we, when, we, when we decided that route, it pretty much pushed the direction of the airplane to, well, if we're not gonna have an instrument panel, we're not gonna have an interior. So we started finishing out the airplane in a more utilitarian fashion. Instead of just looking like it didn't have an interior, we cut the brackets off that we had built and got rid of the, the tabs that hold all the interior and put some tabs up there to hold the piece of wood in and started going through it and pulling out all the things we didn't need, which instantaneously drew, drew Lots of questions from people that were stopping by. What do you mean you're not going to have an instrument panel? Well, we do have a little one. I've got my airspeed and my alt altimeter there in my, my low fuel light. But the that change changed a lot of other things on it. Our boot cowl comes to a different point on the airframe than a normal super cow. The put Now, where do you put a radio became a problem. And when we were doing this, it was before the times of remote radios. So I took a flight, an FL760 flight line radio that I got on Barnstormers for a song and a dance because they were there was no demand for them. And I remote mounted the head. I built a little harness, took the, took the thing apart. It's the radio is back here. And then we had to find a remote mount um, intercom. And it, so it really started complicating things. But now that it's all situated and, it, and it, it works great, and I love the visibility that I have. So, <clears throat> what's this little tiny tank up in the front, and what's the other performance mod you've done? So the, the tank in the front is a header tank. When we initially designed the fuel system, we went with a headerless single on-off valve. It kind of mirrors the Taylor Graph. And what we, what we found is that it all works great, and but we just needed a place to pull some fuel. Um, we Last season for Stoll, we put a nitrous system in the airplane. And that header tank is our pickup point for the wet side of the nitrous. It's a one gallon tank. Um, and I have a, an optical sensor built into it. When that light comes on, the top of the tank is dry. And it if it doesn't go out, then you know that you're don't run the nitro system at that point because you're in a in a possible in condition, which is absolutely absolutely will grenade the motor. All right, Jason, walk us through what 
a standard rear baggage might be and then what you did in comparison. So a standard baggage on a Cub stops right here at the aft, the aft tubes. Um, what we did is we, we put extended lower and upper baggages in. Uh, there's a, a piece down here called the dog leg and usually the dog leg is on the bottom which inhib which prohibits things from sliding through the baggage door easily. So standard, I mean it's just welded into every fuselage you'd buy now. That It's called an inverted dog leg but it, the dog leg is switched up into the top corner instead of the bottom corner. So inverted the dog leg. We built a little bit different aft turtle deck. Um, we modeled it after the PA-18A which was the agricultural model. So it's called a flat back. And, and what that does is it, it takes this X right here, which is where the hopper used to come in, and it opens this area up where a normal cub has a, more of a Y or a V up in here where the flap attached pulleys are. And all the balance cables, which you notice I don't have because I have overhead flaps and the flap system is rigged differently. But the baggage areas were were important to us because we built this airplane not as the stole airplane that it is now, but we built it as a camping airplane that we that my dad and I could load up at the time. Um, this was before kids for me, um, but we could put our gear in there and we could fly to Sun and Fun and have everything that we needed because we, we were real space and weight limited with our Taylor Craft. One of the obvious, some of the obvious mods is you got some really big tires and. Uh, suspension here so that, that's not from the plans I assume <laughs> no it's not um, our entire landing system has morphed from the time that we first built the airplane and when we built the airplane we built the first set of landing gear it was a three inch extended landing gear and we built die springs that was that was the home built shock system of the time you take a 900 pound spring and put it between two pieces of, of welded metal that have washers welded to it and it's just a bouncy boingy system and, but it was it was what we had and what we could build the gear on the airplane now has gone through many different many different changes I've run a lot of different shock setups on the airplane but right now I'm I'm in I'm with Acme Aero and I can't find something that works better for me for my system um, they're light the rebound is almost non-existent and the gear legs on the airplane are, are have changed also they're now a, a three inch extended and a three inch forward so three by three gear which is pretty standard on on airplanes these days a lot of people are going six by three or nine by three and I just three by three seems to work bush wheels that I have um, I've scrounged and found bush wheels and I coat them with Rhino liner, with Herculiner, excuse me. I learned that from an old timer at one of the Super Cub fly-ins. And what, what size are those? Those are 31s. 31s, the airplane originally had 26s on it. Uh, 26 blimp tires, the good years. Heavy, rock hard, you cannot wear them out tires. But these things are nice and soft and as we all know, you can wear them out pretty quick on an asphalt. So. Well, Jay, thanks for giving us a quick walk around tour of your scratch built aircraft. Uh, I've seen you at many different events and stole competitions and things like that over this past year. If somebody wanted to follow your adventures, how could they follow you? So I have a Facebook and an Instagram. Both of them are easily, can easily be found by jay.j.stanford. They'll pop back up and um, follow me on Instagram. Watch us go through our national stole series. Um, follow along as we go camping in South Florida and in North Georgia in that general area. We do a lot of camping this time of year. Thanks for watching this week's episode of the Experimental Aircraft Channel. Remember to like and subscribe. Check out our website and the links below this video to check out our sponsors. Thanks for watching.